Today I'm reading a story for you that I wrote. It is called The Han Dreamer. It is set in ancient China in the Han Dynasty, and that's around 2,000 years ago. Let's start. Three exotic butterflies flutter around the twin hills standing alone in Changsha, Hunan Province, China. These hills are not part of the towering perimeter mountain ranges, yet the secret within is even more surprising than their separateness. For deep, deep down, in a cavern within, there is a clay and charcoal cave. And in the clay and charcoal cave, there is a massive, wooden box. It is the focal point of the room and it dominates the scene. Unlike every other object in the room, it is simple. Around the huge box there are treasures, rolls of silk and cotton, silk scrolls, mirrors, herbs, wine bowls, and plenty of food. There are fabulous colors and handcrafted luxuries. Opening and peeking into the box, there is another wooden box inside. This box is black. The black box's mural sides delight with golden patterns of clouds and tiny Chinese mythical animals. The fluid lines of the clouds float around the box, whispering legendary creatures around the scene. The shy creatures slip in and around the cirrus clouds. Yet hidden within the gorgeous black box is a brilliant scarlet one with blue-green-brown, yellow and white painted dragons, tigers, and deer. Unlike the legendary creatures, these animals are bold. They prance, crouch, and twist in plain sight. The surprises are not over, for within the red box is another smaller box. This one is black, but unlike the other black box, it is embroidered with silk and colorful feathers. The craftsmanship is exquisite. What is this amazing room? There, resting quietly inside the box, is none other than Lady Xin Jue. This is her specially crafted pine bed. Her sweet dreams are undisturbed as she rests inside the smallest black frame, inside the scarlet frame, inside the black frame, inside the plain frame, inside the cave, which is inside the Twin Hills in Hunan, China. Piled all around Xin Jue are her special things. She has an enormous collection of many shapes and colors. Her silk books, cosmetics, dolls, incense, food, and a myriad of other desirable items are all close at hand, as well as her walking stick. Perfume sachets with magnolia petals scent the air, and her pillow is filled with fragrant orchids. It is a personal world of comfort. No wonder Xin Jue rests so soundly. Not to be missed is the T-shaped silken bedspread with pictures of the heavens, the earth, and the underworld draped over the innermost section of her bed. In the heavens of the bedspread are many different kinds of snake-like Chinese dragons and a toad on the moon. There are also nine suns depicted in the top right of the bedspread with the matching character of Hoi, the Chinese mythical archer, featured on the second largest frame of the bed, the black one with clouds. The nine suns must be the nine sunbirds that Hoi shot down to save the people from the burning heat of too many suns in the famous Chinese tale. On Lady Xin Jue's bed, to the right of Hoi, is a feng huang, a bird with a pheasant head, a mandarin duck body, a peacock tail, crane legs, a parrot mouth, 
and swallow wings. Below the Feng Huang and to the far left of Hoi are whimsical, serene, deer antlered, dragon headed chilins with fish scales, ox hooves, and lion tails. Surely, Lady Xinjue often thought about the afterlife to have de designed such an elaborate bed and bedspread depicting her ideas about the life to come. Yet who is this deep-thinking, wealthy Chinese woman? In China, she is called Xin Jue, but Jue is not her family name, nor is Xin her given name. In China, the family name, which is inherited from the father, comes first. So Xin is her family name, and Jue is her given name. If she lived in Canada, she would be called Jue Xin, with her family name at the end. Additionally, a Chinese person is rarely just called by their given name, so Xin Jue would not have been called just Jue. That would have been disrespectful. Xin is simply a Chinese surname or family name. Her given name, Jue, means to chase or seek after something with one's full energy. Her name suits her very well. You will read about some of the things that Xin Jue sought after in this book. Xin Jue's father was Mr. Xin, but her mother was not Mrs. Xin. We do not know more about her father, and sadly, we do not even know her mother's name. Chinese women do not change their names when they get married, so their family names are always different from those of their husbands and children. Furthermore, Xin Jue was a married woman. Her husband Li Tang was very successful. He was a nobleman who was literate and well educated. Xin Jue must have grown up in a privileged family to have been matched with Li Tang. A matchmaker would not have suggested her to Li Tang's family if there was a possibility that they would have been ashamed of her status or questioned her ability to bring the family honor. Following her marriage, Xin Jue would have moved into her husband's household and taken care of his in-laws, sorry, her in-laws, until they passed on. She was not considered a part of her birth family anymore. She would rarely, if ever, see her family again. Still, it was a good match for Xin Jue. Her husband pleased the emperor, Han Hui Di, and he was promoted to full marquis, the highest official and chancellor of nearby Dai County in Changsha Kingdom. Changsha Kingdom was part of the larger Han Kingdom. Li Chang reported to the three councillors of state and then to the emperor, so his position was prestigious. He collected taxes, kept up roads and canals, enforced laws, and defended Dai County and Changsha from invasions. What a busy and important job. Li Tang was also given a special bronze seal to stamp and sign documents. Even though the area of Dai was large and poor with a much smaller population than some of the other counties, his position brought them a privileged life of luxury. Importantly, Xin Jue was also a mother. She gave birth to several sons. This delighted her husband and in-laws. Xin Jue became known as the Marquise of Dai. Usually, she was called by the respected title of Lady Dai. Xin Jue's husband had another cave chamber within the hills but his room was bare and comparatively simple. 
there was just a crossbow and a few other personal items left. Unfortunately, thieves had snuck into Mr. Lee's room and snuck off with his treasures. He was never able to recover his collections again. Meanwhile, the 30-year-old son, a general, was in his own room. The son was clearly a reader. He had a library full of silk and bamboo slab books about history, warfare, archery, horsemanship, medicine, religion, music, literature, mathematics, and astronomy. Some books described how Venus, Jupiter, Mercury, Mars, and Saturn orbit around the sun. They also described comets. He had several maps, carefully ink-drawn onto silk, too. Not to be forgotten, he had a long, wooden crossbow, which was similar to his dad's. On this day, Lady Di was wrapped in 20 silk dresses and many silk ribbons. She was wrapped up like a silkworm in a cocoon. Perhaps she had not been able to decide which gorgeous gown to wear and had thrown them and herself down upon her bed in distress, where she rolled through them, turning around and around. Distress must have become reverberating laughter as layer upon layer of silken clothing became her cocoon. Whatever the reason, Lady Xin Zhui was wrapped in the smooth luxuriousness of the finest Chinese silk, her elaborate, colorful, embroidered dresses. Most spectacular of all was her golden one with embroidered dogwood blossoms and a phoenix flying in the sky. She was clearly a trendsetter. Her silk fingerless mittens and the sachets of fragrance resting in each hand also indicated her high fashion and privilege. Furthermore, she was plump, with a full figure, although her arms narrowed into dainty, frail-looking wrists. At fifty years old, she had aged, and wrinkles accentuated her full face and her broad, flat nose. Folds of loose skin hung from her arms and legs, which had formerly been plumper and stronger. Yet, even at fifty, her skin was as smooth as jade and just as cold. It was the pureness of the most celebrated suet white jade from the mountains of Xinjiang, China. The striking contrast of her magpie black hair and her jade white skin drew every eye. Eyes were upon her, for there were visitors in the room. Yet even still, Lady Xinjue did not rise or respond. She remained silent and still, nestled within the comfort of her bed. The visitors wondered how the lady could continue to lay there for so long. They remarked about her striking black hair, her puffed cheeks, and her skin, which was so soft and moist that she could sell cosmetic creams despite her age. They talked and pointed, snapped photographs, and drew charts, yet the hostess still did not rise to greet her guests. In her dreams, Lady Di sat laughing at a party, eating handfuls of wild Chinese jujubes, pomegranate seeds, and honeyed chestnuts. She nibbled away at pheasant, hare, and coarse meat kebabs, seasoned bear paw, and leopard fetus roasted carp, suckled pig, boiled soft-bellied turtle in gravy, spicy Sichuan-peppered frog in oil, mushroom rice balls, dog and lotus soup, fermented salty beans, pickled bamboo, mussels with leek, fried eggplant, steamed buns with sesame seeds, roasted lentils, and cucumber with vinegar and soy sauce also swirled around in her dreams. Beside her, her companions drank millet and bean congee and sampled still more dishes from the banquet. Xin Jue sipped happily away on sweet rice wine while tapping her foot to the songs of the court musicians.
hours later, she trotted back to her room, still laughing at the jokes and stories that had been shared at the party. She was in no mood to sleep, and went over to her seven-string chin, the instrument of the privileged. She strummed out songs of celebration into the early hours of the morning. Yet in reality, Shindre did not rise to dine and play. She slept on, lying still on her bed, with her eyes closed and her mouth open, as is apt to happen in sleep. Amazingly, despite the endless hours spent on her bed, the sound sleeper still had thick black hair piled on the top of her head in a bun. Her bun looked slightly mussed, but was remarkably intact and fashionable. It was held firmly in place with two hair combs. Meanwhile, her toes stuck out from the silk and were bent upwards with her right foot arched gracefully to the left. Could she be stirring? Kneeling before her, her attendant, who seemed out of place in the luxurious room of Han Dynasty finery, touched her soft skin gently, then flexed her arms at the joints. He then went on to her legs. The others gasped at his audacity, waiting with trepidation. Yet the lady did not resist, and her limbs bent easily. There was motion around her as people shuffled around doing their work, Others simply admired the western hand treasures decorating her room. The room was adorned with intricate wooden carvings, and there was artwork too, including one depicting a banquet dinner. One hundred shiny lacquer-finished wooden cups sat waiting to be filled beside the bronze sculptors and a wooden family of musicians playing their eternal songs. Her seven-string chin sat waiting for the lady to rise, and play her expressive music. Meanwhile, her painted wooden jewelry box was lined with hair combs, cosmetics, and powder pads. The lady's silk scarf and belt sat there too, beside her brass mirror. Around the mirror, there was some fabric painted with pictures of flowering vines and another with flames of gold and silver. There were also books written on silk pages describing health remedies and lifestyle advice. They were placed beside containers of Chinese herbal medicines. The books lay open, waiting for the lady to resume reading. It was a room that she could live in forever, enjoying her precious treasures. She had carefully decorated her bedroom and filled it with the things that she loved most. Meanwhile, her uninvited guests stepped forward. They went to her bed boldly and inspected the bedspread. The lady continued sleeping unaware. Then, these strangers, with magnifying glasses in hand, studied the bedspread even more closely. In the pictures on the bedspread, they discovered a silk-wrapped body surrounded by family at a table of food. There was also a portrait of Lady Xindue, ready to begin walking up to heaven with a cane. The lady was covered with a tapestry depicting her own death and reception into heaven. Eleven months later, Lady Xindue still had not risen from her pine bed and silken sheets. She had, however, been forcibly removed from her silken cocoon. Even now, her body lies still and unmoving as if in sleep, just as it has done for more than 2,000 years. She is still in Hunan, China, yet now she lies in the Hunan Museum rather than in a cave. She is at the museum because Lady Xin Jue is a fleshy Chinese mummy from the Han Dynasty. She is called a wet mummy because amazingly, she still has a full fleshy face, an abundance of piled black hair, and bending joints in a soft human body. However, the lady, the real lady, is not there. Unlike Egyptian mummies, Xin Jue's brain and organs were never removed. 
She still had type A blood in her veins, too. Furthermore, her skin was soft rather than dried out. The Chinese call her a wet mummy, which contrasts with the Egyptians' dry and bony mummies. She was preserved perfectly through techniques which still mystify modern forensic scientists and historians, even the Chinese. Her naturally refrigerated burial chamber enclosed within the hill contributed to her successful mummification. It kept her body at a constant temperature. Furthermore, her body was wrapped tightly in 20 silk dresses to keep out as much air as possible. The pressure from the layers of cloth also suffocated the bacteria. Her four carefully constructed coffins were also vital since they fit inside each other and were sealed tightly. Meanwhile, five tons of charcoal were packed all around the coffins filling the remainder of the chamber. Next, there was one meter of white clay to absorb moisture and a mountain of soil piled on top, completing the man-made hill and sealing Xin Jue with her husband and son in three separate chambers deep within. However, something else was needed to keep the microbes, including fungi, viruses, parasites, and bacteria from feasting off of her body. The largest mystery is how her body could be preserved so well that her skin was still soft and her organs were still intact. Xin Jue is not the only Chinese mummy, but she was the first Han Dynasty mummy to be found, and her discovery shocked the world. Lady Xin Jue designed her coffins and made her burial plans many years earlier. She spent much time thinking about what would happen when she died. She loved her life, except for the back pain and aches. She knew that she needed to plan ahead. She loved her luxuries, parties, food, and entertainment, and that was her vision for the afterlife, too. She knew she must find a way to continue her privileged life of being waited on and entertained. She spared no expense in the pursuit of this goal. It was also more complicated than just designing bronze and wooden servants and musicians to serve and accompany her in the afterlife. Xin Jue consulted doctors, scientists, and scholars on the secrets to immortality. Her husband's influential position gave her access to many important people and new discoveries. These important people helped her to develop plans for an airtight burial chamber and advised her of the perils. Then, after she had a solid plan, she sought out the best skilled workers and paid the craftsmen to construct the coffins and the chamber according to her wishes. That was just the beginning. She imparted her wishes to her most trusted servants. She started the training as soon as she had a plan. She did not know when her earthly life would end. She continued to instruct and remind them of all the steps they would need to perform on the day of her death. She asked them to repeat the instructions back to her many times until she was certain that they would remember. Then, when she was 50, she died. That was around 163 BC, before helping Lady Xin Jue join her husband and her son in the man-made burial hills, others lovingly preserved her body. They followed her directions completely as they mourned her death. Their plan was to immortalize their dear Lady Dai so she would live forever. They mixed cinnabar, a type of red mercury, together with magnesium, alcohol, and salt, Chinese medicine, and some unknown items. It was a secret Chinese recipe, but all of the ingredients were important for killing bacteria. Her servants wrapped her tightly in layers of silk dresses and tied them firmly with silk ribbons. Then, they placed her to rest within her nest of painted pine coffins, not forgetting to cover her body with the secret reddish liquid. Finally, they sealed her within the burial chamber with mounds of charcoal and clay, 
extending the family's burial hills. It was hard work and a long process, but the mourners continued to cry and to sing burial songs. Then, in 1971, near the end of China's Cultural Revolution, Chinese workers were digging an air raid shelter when they discovered the three tombs. It is ironic that Xin Zhui was discovered at a time when there was great anger against the wealthy. At that time, anyone viewed as wealthy or elite became a target, and there was much violence and destruction. However, the government rallied to protect the bodies of Xin Zhui, Li Cheng, and their son with the Han Dynasty relics. Most ironically of all, 1,500 high school students who were notorious around China for destroying anything created by the wealthy now work together to dig up the wealthy Han Dynasty family. During that time, many Chinese young people were enthusiastic supporters of Mao Zedong and communism. They saw that the wealthy had too much influence on Chinese society, and that there was a gap, a great gap, between the rich and the poor in China. The students became activists in the revolution and destroyed many historical artifacts and educational materials. They also destroyed much literature, art, and music. They destroyed these things because the wealthy had created them. They called themselves the Red Guards, and they believed their actions would help bring equality to China. Elementary, middle school, high school, and university students stopped going to school. They banded together to try to bring equality to their country. Four years before Xin Zhui was discovered, all students were ordered to return to school. Since the Red Guard revolutionaries in Hunan province were particularly radical, the students in Xin Zhui's province continued to fight for their beliefs even after they returned to school. They worked hard to show that they refused to become elites in their society and would always work hard. Out of the 1,500 high school students who helped excavate the tombs, some chose to work with the archaeologists because it was a, pro a work project sponsored by the communist government. It pleased them that much digging and manual labor was required. This fit with their values of being useful to their society, even though uncovering an elite family and their amassed treasures did not. Other students were assigned the work by the army. By that time, the students were experienced and destructive revolutionaries, and doing manual labor under supervision was a way for the government to keep them from being too radical or too destructive in their enthusiasm. Times were changing by 1971, and the government was seeing that equality could not be achieved through the Cultural Revolution. The communist government was changing their tactics. However, even during this time of change at the end of the Cultural Revolution, it is amazing that the army and the government protected these three tombs. Many other historical artifacts and great works were destroyed with the approval of the government. With government orders, the 1,500 determined Hunan high school Red Guards worked through the dry 8 degrees Celsius January days of 1972. They sweated, huffed, and puffed as they drove their shovels into the hard ground. Sometimes they sang communist songs together about loving the people and being one with the workers and peasants. Meanwhile, with each shovel load, they got closer to Xin Zhui. Once Xin Zhui was successfully uncovered and documented, her, the archaeologist took her body to the hospital for tests. 
The doctors performed x-rays, examined her body, and then cut it open to discover more about who she was and how she had died. It is amazing that they were able to do these tests since she was more than 2,000 years old. Most amazing of all was that Lady Xin Jue still had her brain, organs, and even red blood in her veins. More specifically, she had type A blood. It astounded the scientists that they were able to discover this, but their discoveries had only just begun. The lady had lived a life of luxury and privilege, but her comfortable life of partying, partying overeating, and sitting had also brought her much pain. The doctors found that she had suffered from lower back pain for a long time because of her inactivity. She also had gallstones and tapeworms. The doctors even discovered that the last food Lady Xin Jue had eaten was musk melon. Her actual death was caused by a heart attack. The doctors did not know before this that ancient peoples also suffered from gallstones and heart problems. Remarkably, Lady Dai's body has remained as it was at 50 years old for more than 2,000 years. Her body is now the treasure of the Hunan Provincial Museum in China. Occasionally, though, her body has even been taken to places like Santa Barbara and New York, where she has been admired and surveyed by many curious eyes. Visitors gasped and gaped, but she still did not rise to charm them. Her body continued to lie as if in sleep. The lady herself, however, has exited her silken cocoon and her fleshy house. Her soul flew into the afterlife like a moth flying out of its cocoon. The discovery of these three tombs with their mummies has helped the world learn much about the Han Dynasty and the lives of the wealthy in ancient China. The artifacts and the design of the burial chambers are significant. However, the autopsy has also revealed the similarities between ancient and modern peoples, and has allowed us to imagine with more accuracy the personalities and lives of the individuals who lived long ago.